Nord Anglia. I've traveled all the way to New York City to visit a very special building. Let's go talk to Laura for today's abstract. She's one of the architects. Welcome, Laura. I'm so excited for your talk. Hi, Fatima. Thank you so much for having me. So hi, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about growing your home with bacteria. My name is Laura Maria Gonzalez. I'm an architect, designer, and scientist. I've always loved building and making things when I was little, and I went to college to study architecture. I have a master's in architecture from MIT, uh, and I worked in New York City to build skyscrapers where people can live and work. This is one of the buildings I got to be a part of in New York City on the right. A lot of skyscrapers are made of steel, but this one is made of concrete, and there are only a few in the city, so it was a really special design. Concrete is, is like a superhero material, right? It, it starts as this soft, squishy mixture like Play-Doh, and then it turns into a very strong rock. And this is what we use to design and build our skyscraper. And on the left, you could see uh, our team when construction started. We were really proud of what we had come up with. I mean, we used so much concrete. We had to shut down the city overnight, New York City. Now, I think for today, it's going to be important to talk about the difference between two words. The first is cement, and the second is concrete. You can think about cement as the glue, and concrete as the glued stuff that cement is a part of. Or another great analogy is, you can think about cement as the flour in a cake recipe, and the concrete is the cake. On its own, the cement is just a powder, but when mixed together with the other ingredients, you get something new. Now, did you guys know that a lot of our buildings, roads, sidewalks, and bridges are made of concrete? It's actually the most popular building material in the world. We use so much of it because it's very strong and it lasts for a really long time. Uh, it's like this building here, it's called the Pantheon. It's in Rome, Italy, and it's made of concrete that's lasted for 1900 years. But I think there's something really important that we should think about when we're making so much concrete and that's that it can have a really big impact on our planet. And that's because in order for us to make concrete, we need the cement, right? That, that powdery stuff. And the making of cement takes a lot of energy. Uh, and releases gases into the air that can be harmful to, to our environment. So while concrete helps us make amazing things, we also need to think about how we use it wisely to take care of our earth at the same time. Now, along with uh, cement, which is a part of concrete, there's also the sand and soils that are a part of it. Um, and a big part of concrete is actually the sands and the soils. And one thing we tend to forget about our soils is that they're alive. Uh, so in just one gram of soil, there's almost 50 billion microorganisms. And some of those microorganisms, well, we can partner with them to create a replacement for cement uh, that doesn't need as much energy or create waste. And I like to call this bio-cement. Bio because it uses biology to produce an alternative cement. And so we do this with bacteria, which is the image that you're seeing in the back. Um, and the bacteria produce what's known as calcium carbonate crystals. So they're producing these, these little white crystals. There's a lot of organisms uh, in nature that uh, create these calcium carbonate crystals. So for example, take coral. They sculpt these beautiful shapes uh, to form our ocean reefs and they also make the calcium carbonate crystals. The bacteria we're talking about, they're not as talented as of sculptures as our corals, but they produce the same types of crystals. And now you might be asking why? Like, why do these microbes uh, want to do this? Why do they spend energy to, to make crystals? Well, it's similar to how other marine organisms like this nautilus shown here, build their shells for protection. So just as this organism creates a shell to keep itself safe and comfortable, these tiny bacteria create calcium carbonate crystals as their mini home or shell. And the crystals <clears throat> can be very strong and they can last a long time. So we're asking the bacteria to do the same thing for us, to make strong and long lasting crystals that we can use to replace cement. 
This way, the bacteria aren't just building homes for themselves, but they're also helping us build our homes too. Now, the bacteria only build their crystal homes around themselves. Uh, so we did a quick test where we put bacteria only in the center of a Petri dish, and then on the right, we distributed all over the Petri dish. And the bacteria don't really mind where they're placed so long as they're fed and they have what they need to build the crystals. And so therefore, if we want to make our bio cement, we need to collaborate with them and we need to place them and tell them where we want to, uh, where we want them to grow our crystals and act as a glue to form our bio cement. Now here's the secret recipe, a secret sauce, and this is the formula for what we use to make our bio cement. So first, of course, is our microbe. Uh, the microbes that we use are typically found in soil. Uh, so again, the kind of soil that you might have in your backyard or sand. Also, you need some sort of mixture, something to put them in, and this is the soil or sand, the aggregate. You also need to add calcium, which we can source from uh, marine organism shells or even eggshells, and that actually has a lot of calcium. And the last ingredient is urea, which is commonly found in a fertilizer. And it takes about a week for this whole process uh, to take shape. So we start by growing our bacteria and uh, we then grow them in a solution that has all of our secret recipe ingredients. We mix them in with the sand in our molds and then as they dry, they start to harden and form our, our bio-cemented tiles. Now, these are the first bio-cemented samples that I worked on. I lovingly call them uh, my sand muffins because although they all started at the same size, when we took them out of their molds, they were all different. And it took a lot of tests to get the crystals to form in just the exact way that we wanted. And that's because we had to learn about what the bacteria liked and needed to build the crystals. In the lab, the process looks a little bit like this. After we've grown the bacteria, we prepare our molds by filling them with sand. So what you're seeing on the slide is a bunch of molds of various shapes that we tested uh, filled with sand. The process we use with bacteria is quite wet. Uh, this is because the bacteria work best in a liquid environment where their food is easier to consume. The liquid also helps us ensure that the bacteria are spread evenly enough, allowing them to make crystals to glue the sand together in the mold. And as I said before, once they're dry, after about a week, we're able to remove the mold, the, the tiles from the molds and see our finished tiles. I think for me, it's pretty extraordinary to think that this is primarily sand and bacteria, right? Like, could you ever imagine that you could go out in your backyard and make this with what you have locally? It's pretty cool. And there are also some things that we didn't expect. So this was a sample that broke when we removed it from the mold. It was just a cylinder. And we were really disappointed, uh, but decided to leave it on our bench instead of throwing it away. And when we came back the next day, we couldn't separate it. I mean, my partner and I were really tugging at this thing. And, and for me, that was really exciting as well, because it reminded us that the material was living and kept forming crystals even beyond when we thought. So as an architect, I realized not only could we produce many tiles, but we could also join them together using the same process to build bigger and bigger things. Now, if we're gonna go and get to our vision of going from tiles to a full building like this one, we need to do some testing to understand how strong and durable our tiles are gonna be. So to do that, we made many and many samples in the lab and did what's known as compression testing to see how strong our bio-cemented material could be. In compression testing, we take a sample of material and we use a special machine to press down on it really hard. We keep pressing until the material can't hold any more weight. Uh, and that tells us how strong the material is and how much weight it can handle before it gets squished. Uh, we do this testing because we need to make sure everything we build is safe and strong. And so there are strengths that we're trying to get to. We also have to go really, really small. So have you ever wondered what things look like really, really close up, like like so close up that you couldn't, that it's, it's smaller than a grain of sand, let's say. And, and that's what we do with this other machine uh, called a scanning electron microscope or SEM uh, for short. 
and lets us see tiny things that we can't see with our eyes or even with regular microscopes. And we do this uh, when we're trying to make stronger materials like our bio cement, because we need to actually see the shape of our tiny crystals. Uh, and that's because the shape affects the strength. So even though we're making calcium carbonate crystals, they come in lots of forms. So they can be cubes, they can be spheres, and they can be everything in between. What we want is cubes, but we got spheres. Uh, so here you're seeing one of those images that we got from this microscope. And the big clumps are actually sand particles. And then the smaller clumps are what our bacteria produce. And if we zoom in on one of those smaller clumps, we see our fossilized bacteria. So in the center is our community of bacteria. And just as I mentioned before, they're forming this protective shell around themselves out of this calcium carbonate. And it was really exciting to, to see uh, just kind of how they lived uh, on the sand. Now, we've seen that bacteria can make biocement, but uh, I also want to dive into another superpower that we can give them. Uh, this is an image of the Grand Prismatic Spring uh, in Yellowstone Park, and it has really vibrant colors. And those colors are actually made from bacteria that live on the floor of the lake. And depending on the UV or the heat produced, uh, they give off different colors, different yellows, oranges, reds. So what if we could engineer bacteria to help us detect other things in our environment, like pollution, and, and clean it up? That's where synthetic biology comes in. It's like adding a new feature to bacteria. So by changing their DNA, which is like their instruction code, we can make these tiny helpers change color in response to different conditions. So it's not just colorful, it's as if they're giving us a living signal about the health of our environments. And what that said to me is maybe our material, maybe our bricks isn't just sand, but it's actually this living colorful tapestry that uses bacteria to create colors just as that spring. And the different colors could tell us about different pollutants in our air, soil, and water, and communicate with us the health of our surrounding by changing into all sorts of colors. So imagine it's not just a new type of concrete that we make, but a living system that senses and responds to our world. And we could add these as bricks to our homes, or we could incorporate them into walls with openings that allow air to go through while removing pollutants. It's like a living air filter. As an architect, I have to think about what those bricks look like uh, because it's really important that the bacteria stay alive and happy in our bricks. So we should customize the design to what they like and what they want, not just what we want as humans. To figure that out, I identified and used microbes that would change colors. And then I tested them on the brick material to see if, if they would produce pigments and, and change pigments over time. And so here you're seeing some of those tests that I did where the colors changed either to pink or to blue over the course of 24 hours. And one of the things I found out is that the microbes like to breathe as much as we do. Uh, and so we designed the surfaces to touch as much air as possible. So the result wasn't as much of a brick, but these custom pieces that were very textured and grooved so that the bacteria could thrive in those nooks and crannies and, and change colors. And I found a way to make these tiles and, and to fabricate them, creating processes that were much more three-dimensional to cater to the bacterial needs in addition to what we hope to do. And so for me, this is the first step towards that vision of growing our buildings. And I'm really excited to find out just how funky and lively they will be. Now, I wanna wrap up with what I'm doing when I'm not with uh, my bacterial friends and that's building machines. Uh, I love making and building things and machines are no exception. So here's a video of me assembling my very first one. I had never done anything electronic. I was so scared, but you just have to go for it, right? And, uh, you know, I think it was a really rewarding process. And it now has gotten to the point where, well, Let's just say I have more machines than the space for them. So this is my place and, and you can see there's a lot of machines and tools everywhere and I love it. 
I even have, uh, you know, this, this, there's this one 3D printer that sits on my stool and it's my clay 3D printer and I use it to make sculptures. I really need to figure out another way to do this. But, uh, you know, these machines for me are a way for me to express my artistic self. And so I make these sculptures uh, using clay 3D printers, plastic 3D printers. And with that all in there, I'd love to hear about your hobbies. What do you guys like to, to make as well? And, you know, any questions that you might have on, on growing your own home in the future. So thank you guys so much for having me. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laura. This was really cool. I love the pictures at the end. Um, so I wonder if we could kick off the Q&A from a, a question from our guest, Tiara. And Tiara is wondering, have you ever designed a building or a structure that was inspired by nature? And if so, how did you incorporate elements from the natural world into your design? That's such a fantastic question. So yes, oftentimes I'll design things that are inspired by nature, uh, in, in particular buildings, uh, but they don't look exactly like you think. They don't exactly copy what nature looks like. Instead, we like to think about the principles behind nature and incorporate that into our buildings. So for example, how does a tree function and how do our buildings function like trees to, let's say, filter the air, to provide shelter for people, to provide habitats and covers for those that are inside the building but are outside. Mm -hmm. and, and so through that, we like to think about buildings as, as trees or as other living things, although we don't make them look exactly like the trees, let's say. Got it. And speaking of, you know, using those... Um as inspiration and to help you start thinking about it. We have a question from a North Anglia student who's wondering how you design another aspect of this process. And they want to know, how do you pick the shapes for your molds? And how do you prepare the molds in the first place? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So how do I pick the shapes? So one of the things I talked about uh, was uh, that the bacteria love oxygen. They love air. They want to breathe. And so the designs of the molds were always uh, fairly thin, uh, so not very thick to give the bacteria lots of access to oxygen. And I played with shapes that, um, that were quite big and flat. So I was working with hexagons, let's say, uh, and these are great shapes to tile, like think like honeybees. They kind of create these uh, hexagon uh, interconnecting uh, little units um, because they're really efficient. And so I started with hexagons. And then if you squish the hexagons a little bit, you get these clover shapes. And so that's that's what you started to see. So I was trying to increase the area that the bacteria could 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 use. And then to to make the uh, the molds. So those were three d printed. And the the interesting thing about this process is the bacteria stick to everything. One of the hardest things that we had to actually figure out was, how to unstick them from the things that we didn't want them to stick to. Uh, and so the, the sand muffins that I showed you guys, those were actually from a silicone uh, muffin like pan. And uh, when we tried to get them out, we couldn't because they glued to, to the silicone. And we found actually that, that the plastic did a good job of keeping enough separation uh, from the sand and the bacteria. So we were able to remove them much easier. So they were 3D printed plastic and they were uh, they had lots of tiny holes in them, especially at the bottom. So as we poured their food, the food would kind of go through and they could uh, make use of it and then dry out. So that was the process of, of making it. And, and the designs were partly creative and also just partly thinking about what they need. And Got it. Wow, that is really interesting, especially the part where you found that they were just so sticky and sticking to everything else you tried to grow there. I think that's so cool. So they were growing right onto that and, and doing that same process that you showed us when you showed us that cylinder that broke, but then the next morning it had reattached itself because these bacteria seem to be so good at attaching themselves to things, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we tried metals, we tried resins, we tried rubbers. It took us a while and, and somehow the plastic seemed to do quite well. Got it. And were these 3D printed in the lab or did these get 3D printed in your apartment? 
they did get 3D printed in my apartment. <laughs> That's <laughs> just, I know my machines and they work really well. <laughs> That's awesome. That's really cool. Our next question from a North Anglia student is, is this bio cement that you're working with structurally stronger than regular cement? Did you have a chance to compare the two? Yeah, absolutely. So that's uh, why we did the strength testing to see how does it compare to a standard concrete. And the mixture that we were that we came up with, it was a very weak concrete. So we weren't quite at the standard that we need to build a building that told us uh, that we needed to keep working to make it stronger or to think about it as a, a material we could use on the interior of buildings or not weight bearing uh, as it is right now. But there are definitely uh, techniques that can be used to continue to improve the strength of the concrete. And we do think that it can get to, to concrete strengths. That is really exciting and super promising. That actually leads us to another question. So let's say you're using these tiles in these in these buildings eventually. Um, we have a, a North Anglia community member wondering if the tiles or the buildings are made with this bio cement, which has this bacteria and it's very alive. Could the buildings change shape over time? Could these end up doing things that we don't expect shape-wise? What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So in terms of them changing shape, you would have to add more sand. So maybe they would <clears throat> maybe they would add layers over time, but it wouldn't be like a whole shape, a new shape, like a whole new body that you kind of get out of them um, because they're working at a very, very small scale. So one of the exciting things though, is that because they are alive, they do continue to produce crystals and we might not see it, but it will have an impact on strength. So the longer that they grow and the older that they are, the stronger they will be. So while it might not be a, a, a visible difference, there will be like a mechanical difference in, in the material. And in terms of doing unexpected things, that's all we talk about in, in microbiology is like, we think they're doing one thing, but they might switch it around on us and do something else. And it's really important to consider if we do use these materials in our living environment, what are the risks? Are there anything that we need to consider to make sure that we don't make unintended changes to our environment that might have negative consequences, even though we're trying to do something really good for the environment? So it's something that we study as well. Absolutely. So you have to be thinking about a lot of different things at once when you're working on, on these sorts of uh, biocement built things. And that actually leads well into um, a, a question that we have from Patrizia. And Patrizia is wondering, do you end up collaborating with microbiologists as part of this work? Or is that part of your background? Did you study that before? Patrizia, that's a fantastic question. The last time I did biology, I was really, really young. I was like in middle school or high school. And so I absolutely collaborated with microbiologists at MIT. I think it's one of the most fantastic things about being at MIT is that you get to work with people that are really talented and very knowledgeable. And so uh, I worked with... Um, at, at MIT, we have a bio maker space. It's like a maker space, but for bio. And there I met uh, the director of the lab, Justin Buck, who was incredibly talented and said, that's a very interesting problem. I've never worked with those microbes before, but let's do it. And together we would kind of uh, figure out, you know, what wasn't working and how to improve. Um, so absolutely, yes, my background isn't in biology. But I, I think and I would encourage everyone to kind of be uncomfortable and learn something that, that you know, they don't know anything about, because you'll soon find that, that you can become the expert, the expert, too. So, yeah, I've, I've learned a ton about biology uh, in the past few years uh, about these little microbes. And it's, it's great to bring my perspective as an architect to a field that might not have thought about it in that way. Got it. That is that is really cool. And, you know, in the beginning of your presentation, you had shown us a picture of um, a material being fired in a kiln. And you showed us that it was really hot. And we have some North English students who might not be familiar with that. So could you tell us really briefly what a kiln is? Yeah, so a kiln is essentially this machine that is able to get to really, really high temperatures. So it's often actually used if you've ever made clay, like clay pottery. So when you make clay, it's kind of wet and squishy, and then you dry it out and you put it in this kiln. 
the kiln is this machine that fires it or like heats it up to really, really high temperatures, thousands of degrees. And that allows the, the material to kind of like set and harden to its uh, like ultimate strength. And so when you take it out, it's this finished piece that's really, really strong. And so in the in the context of concrete, they have to fire uh, this, this, this limestone to make the cement. And in order to do that, they have to fire it at thousands and thousands of degrees. So heat it up for a really long time. And that outputs a lot of carbon, which right now we're thinking about, well, how do we minimize to, to help our environment? And so that's the that's the kiln, that's the firing process. Wow. Okay. That is really hot. I cannot even imagine. And now to to follow up um, with a few more questions about the biosummit. I we have a lot of interest in the chat for that. So I'm I'm so excited to see it. We have a question from Pranika. And Pranika is wondering what happens if this bio cement gets wet? Let's say you've used it to build the outside of a building and it rains, like what happens? Yeah, I think it's such a great question. And this is something that, that we're in the midst of studying. So if the cement is strong enough, if the, the crystals are dense enough, nothing will happen. And it will be so dense that it actually creates a seal on the material so that when the rain comes in, it just kind of comes down. Now, if it's weak, uh, and it's not uh, formed enough crystals, the water will seep in. And when the water seeps in, it'll start to erode our crystals and effectively dissolve our building. Now, what's interesting is this is actually a problem in concrete, in the concrete that we use in buildings today. So the concrete that we use today actually also gets a sealer uh, as, a, as a final coat, a different material, so that water can't penetrate. Because if the water goes in, the tiny cracks that are in the concrete, it can cause damage and erode the concrete just as it would erode our bio cement. So we're trying to understand how dense do you need to get your bio cement so that when you pour water on it, it won't just dissolve. Uh, and there's definitely a bit more testing to, to do there. Totally fair. Okay. And speaking of testing and thinking about this material and use in the future, we have a question from a North Anglia student who's wondering, would the cost of this production be sustainable and how expensive do you think it'll be compared to normal building materials like concrete, for example? And if it's not currently there, what do you think needs to happen to make its production more feasible and scalable? Yeah, another great question. Uh, so when it comes to cost, biology is on our side. So it's actually uh, quite economic to, to build with biology because biology just grows and grows and grows. So as long as we have one cell, we can make a lot, a lot of cells. The most expensive part of the process is the water, the water that we need to kind of feed them, uh, feed them with. Because for materials like uh, the, the calcium or the urea, we can use waste flows from other manufacturing processes to go into this process. And so what is most expensive about our process is water. And that's something that we need to think about and address uh, as, as you move forward and scale this, this up to, to a construction scale. But in terms of the cost, the, the cost of producing biocement versus concrete can be very close. Uh, and, and I think it would be less of an issue uh, than initially thought. Okay, well, that's really exciting. And so that leads us to a, another fantastic question from a North English student. They're wondering, okay, these costs are comparable. Have you already built anything with the bio cement tiles you've made? Yeah, that's, that's where we're headed to build bigger and bigger things. So it was really exciting to get to the tiles. I mean, even to get to the tiles took us two years, right? Like that's pretty long time to figure out. And now we're thinking, okay, how do we build bigger? And how do we think about weather and durability so that we could put these things outside? I think another thing that, that we're all trying to address as well is what we've talked about before, the safety factor of what we do. So if we have these microbes, they're really wonderful in, in the lab, but if we take them out, will they affect the local soil microbe? Like what if you wanna grow your vegetables in a soil that there's a bio-cemented building in? Will that have any effect to what we do? Now, when we talk about bio-cement, there's no engineering. These are microbes that are in the soil but maybe they're from a soil in a different state, in a different country, in a different region of the world. So what happens when you bring that soil 
to a different place. And that's something that we have to think about before we take this to the, the building scale, let's say. Got it. Okay. So it's back to that big picture thinking about once this is out in the environment, what are all the new things we have to think about and the interactions it could have with other living things? I think that's that's really cool and definitely a lot to think about. Um, bringing this question, our next question is going to bring you home, actually. Um, mm -hmm. You showed us these amazing 3D printers. You told us that you actually printed the molds in, in your apartment uh, on the printers you built. So now North English students wondering, you know, they're taking it a step further. Could you use your clay 3D printer with your bio cement before it's hardened? Yes. So I, that is so fantastic. So I will say when this project started, I was doing a class where we had to build our own machine and myself and a collaborator wanted to build a machine that could 3D print bio cementing bacteria. And that is where we started. And we realized we were so naive because we needed to learn so much about the bio cement before we could put it in the printer. Now we've gotten to a point where we understand the, the bio cement and the process. So yes, we would absolutely be so excited to try and like put it into our, you know, to my 3D clay extruder. The only thing is I have to take it to the lab and slap a biohazard sticker on it and it might never be able to leave the lab again. So that's kind of tough, but uh, that is the dream is to combine and, and to think about, you know, it's wonderful to have this very sustainable material, but then also with 3D printing that can open up a lot of really exciting possibilities. So yes, fantastic suggestion. I love it. 3D printing, biocementing bacteria. I think that's the future for sure. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Nord Anglais students are on it. We have actually they're a couple just on of it. <laughs> Yeah, they are. They, they're already connecting all the dots here. And I think that's fantastic. And taking it, you know, again, they're so excited about this work. We have multiple questions in the Q&A pod this morning asking, can we do this at home? How can we make biosumet? Do you have any advice for how they can get started in this, maybe at a different scale? Yeah, oh, such a fantastic question. So so the tough thing would be finding the bacteria, right? Um, I might suggest, so one of the things I'm trying to work on is making this more accessible and giving the, the like instructions to local uh, community bio labs and bio spaces, because we do want to perform the work safely. And there's lots of things in our soils. So I might recommend seeing if there's a, a community bio lab close to you that might be able to help you get started um, because the bacteria is such, such a key, key part of this. Um, but even just learning more about what's in your soils, like that's a fantastic place to start. I didn't know what was exactly in my soils when I started, and I've learned that there's so much life uh, in there and there's so much happening. Um, so while you can't just go in your backyard and play with it just yet, I would hope that in the future there would be more accessible resources to, to do so. I hope so too. I would like to do this as well. <laughs> we have a question from uh, Ria, and Ria's wondering, do the bacteria ever die, and, and what happens? How long do these materials live, and, and what happens to the structures they build afterwards? Oh, such a great question. Yes, so the bacteria lifespan in general is fairly short, but as long as they have food, they continue to, to kind of grow, and um, what, what happens over time with, with these bacteria when they don't have food is that they go into hibernation. So they, they create something called spores and it's like a sleeping hibernating state. And then once they have air to breathe and food to eat again, they come to life and they start dividing and reproducing and, and growing into another community. So it's one of the, the more interesting facts about this bacteria is that yeah, you could produce your bio cement, you could produce your tile. And then just as my tile that broke, you know, you have a crack in your tile. Oh my goodness. You bring the tile together. You make sure that it's uh, has food and, and air and it's going to rejoin itself. It's going to self heal. Right. So bacteria are incredible because they, they can live, but they can also sleep until they're ready to kind of come alive again. And for some that, that means, oh, self healing, healing materials, um, but for, for me, it means that they can be there for, for quite a long time. That, okay. That is really good to know. And now following up to that, they can be there for a long time. They have a lot of 
powerful abilities that are just so different from traditional building materials. And one of those abilities that you showed us is this beautiful like biosensing. So we can use these microbes to kind of tell us about the other things in our environment in a really cool and beautiful way. So we have a, a North Anglia student wondering if you could walk us through, how could they tell us about air pollution? I think you alluded to that in your presentation. Yeah. So there are bacteria that can uh, sense different uh, uh, different environmental uh, like uh, uh, qualities. So I showed how in the in the lake they're sensing UV and they're sensing uh, the heat, the temperature of the water. Well, there are microbes that can also sense uh, different uh, like chemicals uh, in the air. Let's say. And they're very sensitive to this. And so they just, they, they sense it and then they might do something. Well, with synthetic uh, biology, you can say, okay, when you sense uh, this one chemical in the air, can you give me a color? Can you produce a color? And so you might tie that to like pink. And so now when there's a toxic chemical in the air, your bacteria might start turning pink. If there's enough of that bacteria, the brick will start turning pink. So if there's enough of that in the air, the bricks will start turning pink. And now you know, oh, okay, well, I should be careful about the this one chemical in the air. Um, but what's exciting for me is the bricks can also help you uh, remove that chemical because biocementation locks stuff in. So if you biocement through that air, then you might be able to remove some of those pollutants and like lock it inside inside of the brick. But the sensing uses what bacteria naturally do, their ability to be like, oh, there's this in the environment. And so I'm going to do this. And then we can say, OK, I'm going to give you some additional instructions and turn pink when you sense this. Uh, so that's one way uh, to kind of think about it. Oh, darn, that is just so cool. I would just love to see that in real life, that process happening. That's just so neat. Um, students who I think are interested in pursuing similar kinds of work in the future and building biosements, they have a question about timings. We have a couple of students asking us, can you tell us, you took, you told us it took us, it took you a couple of years to get to that tile stage, but now that you know it, how long does it actually take to make one tile or brick from this biocement? Enough that you could, you know, use it in a building per se. Yeah, so it takes about a week to, to from when we start with our bacteria to when we have a hardened tile. Um, and it's it's pretty similar to concrete. I mean, concrete can can set really fast, like the, the concrete that we build with today. Um, but full strength takes 30 days. So we're we're in that kind of time frame. Now, if you want to build a building, it's all about how many tiles you can produce, right? So there it's all about scale and manufacturing. And to me, it was so interesting being in a lab environment because in a lab, everything is very small. You do tiny samples and you know you look at them under the microscope and you produce more tiny samples. So it was definitely a challenge to think about, okay, how do I produce a hundred of these? So I think in order for us to build buildings with this, we need to make a new type of lab space that can uh, handle bigger productions so that we can manufacture lots of tiles at the same time. So there we would just have lots of different molds that maybe we can reuse time and time so we're not being wasteful. And then we're always growing our bacteria. And then as one tile kind of finishes and sets, we load it back up and we add more bacteria and we go again until we have enough tiles to, to build our building. So it's it's taking what I know from architecture and pushing the boundaries of the science lab to come up with new manufacturing workflows. But I'm thinking it takes a week to build a tile. Maybe in a month you'd have enough to build a building. <laughs> yeah. We'd have to test oh. it out. Yeah, I'll come and help you. We'll build it together. <laughs> I love it. And so unfortunately, we have over 100 amazing questions still in this chat, but we don't have enough time to ask them all. So I wanted to, to leave us on a, a full note that will help students who are interested in pursuing this in the future um, get some footing. So Laura, could you share with us some resources or insight or places uh, to where these students could turn to learn more about design, architecture, building with biology, perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I have to say, I learned so much myself from, from YouTube. 
from accessing the different lessons on biology for people of all ages, which, you know, I really needed. I needed simple terms. Uh, and, and so that was, was a, definitely a great resource for me. Um, off, off, like, you can always reach out to me as well. Uh, you know, just uh, shoot me a message on Instagram or, you know, uh, I think my website has my email um, if you, if you want to learn more. Um, but I'm, I'm really excited because I think more and more bio design and biofabrication uh, is becoming a topic of discussion. And so there's, you know, always stay tuned for events happening locally. Um, and again, like YouTube, social media, Instagram, TikTok, people are doing crazy things. So I found a lot, lot through there, really accessible. Um, so yeah, check out bio design, biofabrication. Those are really great words if you're interested in this type of topic. Um, and, uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me as well. That's fantastic advice. Um, Laura, and you mentioned your, your social media a little bit. I know I got to take a look at your Instagram and it might be the most beautiful and exciting Instagram I've ever seen. Could you just remind us of your handle for those of us who might, uh, on this call might want to look at that for inspiration? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you can find me at microbi.xyz. So that is M-I-C-R-O-B-I dot X-Y-Z. So it's like microbial, but microbi dot X-Y-Z. Uh, and I post things about bacteria, 3D printing, and design. So feel free to follow along. That's fantastic. And that is on your Instagram. And that's also your website, if I have that correct, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's also okay. my website. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm sure that the excited and amazing students who joined us today are going to be checking that out um, very soon. And now before before I let you go, Laura, I have to um, uh, remind folks next month we're speaking to Malik and Miles about their PhD experiences um, in biological engineering. So stay tuned for that. And, and with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining today. I would love to thank the students and the teachers for asking such fantastic questions today and for everyone who's joined us. I'd like to thank the Nord Anglia Education MIT Collaboration um, for supporting this series and making this magic happen. And then lastly, I'd like to thank Laura for all of your amazing time and insight today. It was truly a pleasure to see the work you're doing. And I think we all are looking forward to following it in the future. Thank you guys so much for having me and thank you everyone for joining. Of course, all right. Bye everyone, bye Laura. Bye.